Friends, hello. This is episode 554 of the Juice Box Podcast, and I am here to welcome you to it. I hope you guys know me well enough by now to know that I would not bring you crap. You understand what I'm saying? This is a great conversation with Katie, and I want to give you a little teaser about it, but uh, if I'm being completely honest, I'm rushing to get these episodes together. Um, My mom's having a little bit of a health issue, and I need to get these up on the internet for you so they arrive when you expect them to, but I don't have a ton of time. So Katie's cool. She has type one diabetes. She's had it for a long time. She's going to talk to you about a bunch of stuff. If I'm remembering correctly, she was pregnant during this. And yes, indeed, I have a follow up email from her to let you know how it's going or how it went. And um, uh, I mean, listen, trust me, this is a great conversation. You're going to spend the next hour absolutely enjoying yourself with your headphones on. Please remember while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Please always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. And if you want to keep somebody in your thoughts today, my mom's name is Bev. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. This episode of the podcast is also sponsored by Touched by Type 1. They just want you to head over and check them out. Touchedbytype1.org. They're also on Facebook and Instagram. And by the way, the Dancing for Diabetes extravaganza, you know about it? If you don't, head over to touchedbytype1.org to find out. But if you do know about it, and you want to get tickets, they're available right now. The big event is on Saturday, November 13th at 7 p.m. It's in the Walt Disney Theater at the Dr. Phillips Center in Orlando, Florida. Touched by Type1.org. Tickets are on sale now. They are not expensive. Dance fans, head over. If you're not a dance fan and you just want to support a super great organization helping the people with diabetes, do it. Super great. Not a real word. I'm sorry, I'm rushing. Links in the show notes, links at juiceboxpodcast.com. All right. Well, hi, my name is Kate. I am 38 years old. And should I just go through a little brief synopsis of my diabetes history? I, 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 you know, I think it's time for me to come clean. I love screwing with people and just being like, go introduce yourself. Cause I'm so interested to see who will like, some people are very worried about the content. Some people are worried about saying too little, too much. I'm all fascinated by it. You don't have to say that. Just keep going. You're fine. <laughs> how, oh, how old were you when you were diagnosed? I was 18. It was 20 years ago. Right. It was. Yeah. So proud that. of myself. Carry the one. So proud of myself. <laughs> um, yeah. I um, found out right before our prom, my senior year in high school. Hmm. That's not fun. And it was typical standard signs, losing weight, really thirsty, um, vision issues when I, when I had always had perfect vision. Um, in fact, my friends thought that I was bulimic because I was still eating so much, but losing so much weight. So that there was an intervention regarding being bulimic. And I, you know, of course ended up not being that. Um, My stepfather at the time was a emergency room physician and swore because I I played a lot of sports outside tennis and softball. and, And we were living in Georgia at the time, which of course is hot weather and he swore that I was dehydrated. So hooked me up to an IV in my room because of course, being a physician, have all of those materials at the house. And my mom was a, um, or still is a labor and delivery nurse. So she also for having two clinicians at home had a urine sample cup. And so they had me do that. And she brought that into work that evening. (laughs) And then we got the call that I was, you know, on the verge of going into a diabetic coma and I should get in right away. And something else my stepdad at the time had given me was some sort of like relaxer. Um, so driving to the hospital, I was just in this daze of like 
I, I don't know. He tranked you? <laughs> yes. He gave me like some sort of a tranquilizer. And so I, I vaguely remember being in the hospital, even though I was 18. Um, I kind of just remember. It's so weird. I've had so many endocrinologists over the time or over the years. Um, and I don't remember a whole lot of names, but I do remember his. Um, and he's Canadian, so he had a you know different accent. Um, of course, very different than most of the people in, in Georgia. And he had held my hand and said, you know, this was an opportunity for me to become an endocrinologist and to develop a cure and that I would be very, you know, critical to that development. And, and I always see. think back to that conversation. And at one point I had thought about going to medical school and then, you know, going into the specialty, but then the thought of being in school for that long deterred me. The, um, the empowerment of one Canadian well-meaning man did not overwhelm you that much? <laughs> no. Yeah. So, I, you know, I and I always go back and ask my mom, like, do you think that that was relevant? And it, I think looking back now, I would have said it was relevant. But of course, as an 18 year old who is like slightly um, drugged, I didn't really think too much into it. <laughs> As an 18 year old on tranquilizers in DKA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Didn't, it didn't feel like career day to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I can see I can see the um the desire from him. You know, mm -hmm. like like your your family's in medicine. He's probably trying to make you feel like, you know, here's your, you know, an empowering moment and everything like that. He didn't know that uh your dad had whacked you out of your head and you didn't know what right. was going on. You know, it's funny as you're telling that story, a friend of my daughter's has two nurses for parents. And I remember one time on a FaceTime call when she was sick, she had the flu or something looking at her and she was on an IV in her bedroom. And I, I remember thinking like, what the heck? And mm -hmm. my, my daughter's like, oh yeah, her parents are nurses. And I was like, oh. <laughs> Still, I didn't know that meant you could take it home with you, but all right, yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> like, well, that's and, they, and this was, you know, however many years ago, so maybe not possible anymore. But <laughs> you think your dad just walked out with it, uh, just slung over his shoulder, like, I'm just leaving with this stuff. And they were like, that's exactly. fine, it's the 90s, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Well, okay, that sucks, but how did you make out afterwards? Did you, did you bounce back, or was it a rocky ride? Um, it was, I mean, I think probably similar to a lot of people's stories. I, you know, I didn't at that time, of course, there was no loop. There was no Dexcom. It was manual injections. And, um, I think the hardest part for me was just the timing of it. Mm -hmm. Um, at the end of my senior year in high school and I was getting ready to leave for college and, you know, just a few short months. And so I think that was really hard for my mom and, you know, leaving me at the dorms with this newly diagnosed disease. Um, I don't know that I handled it the best that I could in college between beers and pizza and hamburgers and French fries. Um, and then I I'm surprised that worse things didn't happen before that, you know, they, they did. Um, I had a seizure, I think my first seizure when I was in after a long night of partying in Spain when I was studying abroad there. Um, I think that was my sophomore year of college after my sophomore year of college. And then that was kind of like my wake up call. Like I need to get a little bit more serious about this. Hey, studying abroad is code for drinking in another country, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And um, let's see. Then fast forwarding a little bit, let's see, I, you know, I, I started to clean up my act. I, after college, I actually moved abroad to Peru. So I studied finance and Spanish in college and, and really the amount of Spanish that I learned while in Spain was minimal. Um, and so I decided that I needed to go on my own somewhere and that um, I had a teacher in college who we used to be the the former director of the uh, an English institute in Trujillo, Peru. So I moved there, and then my best girlfriend shortly followed after. And then I um, was on the time I was on the I think a Medtronic five twelve pump, mm -hmm. in which they said at the time that it was um, waterproof, 
Um, I can't remember what else, but I, I ended up on a trip in a, like a remote beach in Northern Peru and the pump broke. And of course I'm, what was I 21 traveling by, I mean, literally like one of those Jansport backpacks. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have the pharmacy with me. Um, so I had no, I had no insulin. I did have a syringe, I think was what I had with me. And then we would plug that into the vial from the pump or what I was using to refill the pump is maybe what it was. I can't remember now it's been so long, but, um, and then every like hour and a half giving our myself insulin until we got, it was an eight hour bus ride back to Trujillo um, because there was only one doctor in this town and he knew nothing about diabetes. I remember calling my stepdad on the phone just in tears because I'm like, what did people do here in Peru? Do they die? And I, I think they do at that time. I think they did die from diabetes, like, you know, back in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. So um, I thought that it, my trip was ending short and I was coming back to the U.S. And um, after discussing with a private clinic in Trujillo what I needed, they found what is it called? Like an NPH insulin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you for went basal. back to like regular and NPH. You were probably yeah. never on that, though. No, I was never on it. And yeah. that's the one where it like has a peak 30 minutes after you take it. Yeah. Yes. So they gave me that. And it was like a used vial that they had already had. And it was in the refrigerator. I and mean, it was so weird. But they like showed it to me like, is this what you need? Like, and I guess so. <laughs> yeah. So I started taking that. Of course, they didn't explain it to me about the 30 minutes. I have no idea it, it, there, You know, I ended up having a seizure in Peru, which is I don't recommend to anybody and go into a public hospital um, my best friend who, you know, found me in the kitchen was terrified. Um, Kate, for clarity, you do not recommend having a seizure in Peru. Is that right? <laughs> no. Let me just write no, that down. I don't really not that. anywhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what was happening is you were taking that insulin the way you were taking your previous insulin, but it didn't work anywhere near the same way. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And because I had no guidance, I mean, from them, they didn't know, um, the Peruvian so, yeah, doctor that gave you an open vial of insulin was no help, huh? Yes. Yeah. What a I shock. mean, it was better than having to get on the next flight back to the U.S., but... Well, yeah, because that was your other option, was to get on a plane and go into DKA in the sky and just hope somebody comes and scoops you up at the airport, right? Well, and I, yeah, I guess I could have, you know, I could have made the, I think it was, I think it was eight hour bus ride to Lima. I could have done that. And maybe there would have been a private clinic there that would have been more advanced. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but yes, it was quite the, quite the experience. No well, kidding. I opted to not, well, I couldn't go back on the pump, um, at that point. And then mm -hmm. when I did come back to the U S I, there was a boat trip and, um, uh, for the week, like a Memorial day weekend trip. And I think that was like, right as Medtronic release. Oh, we said this was waterproof, but it's not. And I said, okay, I'm not doing the pump thing anymore. I hated the, the, cords, the cables, the TV. wires, and hmm. trying to figure out where to best wear it. Um, it may, I hate figuring out what to wear every day. And that just made it extra challenging. Gotcha. So at that time I went off the pump and I stayed off the pump until I, after having my second kiddo. After the second one. Mm -hmm. I love how some of you diabetes old heads say the pump. By the way, just in case you're wondering, I love instead that. of the pod. I, no, not even that. Just like a pump. It's like the pump. It's a weird. I I love it. It's absolutely <laughs> endearing. But you don't realize that it's there are um, other pumps. Well, I just that younger people don't seem to say it the same way. Like, be, and I think it's because at some point in history there was a pump which made it mm -hmm. the pump. Y mm. You know what I mean? Like you go on the pump. It's not like there were 10 of them and you're like, oh, I right, wonder which right. we pump. didn't have choices. Yeah, there were no choices. I just I think that's delightful. And I mean, old head in the nicest way, like you've had diabetes yes. for a while, uh, yep. which, which to me is a is a absolute badge of courage. Uh, so <laughs> I think of it as a great thing. But I just that, that always please. It always just it delights me to no end. So you so how long is it from leaving the pump until you've had your second kid? <laughs> oh, gosh. Hmm. Um, that was, you know, around 21 until my second kiddo now is two and a half. I can't believe you sat still long enough to have children because it sounds like you were on a mad tear as a young girl. 
Yes. I mean, I traveled all over the world. I, my work travels brought me all over the world. Um, I enjoyed myself for quite some time and didn't really find my person until much later in life. Yeah. So I just feel like and, at any point in my life, if you would have said to me, do you want to go to Peru? I would have gone, no. And that would have been the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, oh. I love to travel and I have never let diabetes hold me back. In fact, um, I loved listening to some of the, especially the one about the daughter who I think it was went to Mount Everest, mm -hmm. maybe. That was really interesting to me because right before we found out I was pregnant with the first, I actually had my trip booked to do the Annapurna circuit in Nepal. And the, the scariest part, I guess, for my partner, my now husband, um, but partner at the time was that I wanted to go by myself. I had had the trip planned before him and I met and him knowing I was diabetic and, um, you know, some of the things that could come up in high altitude, et cetera. Um, he insisted on going. And so it was last minute we decided, okay, fine, you can come with me. And then I think it was like that weekend he got the approval for work, you know, from his work to be gone. And we were about to book it when we found out, I think it was literally like that Tuesday and we were going to book his trip on Wednesday. Hmm. So I ended up not being able to go do the Annapurna circuit in Nepal, but maybe one day, but that, that um, podcast was really helpful because of, you know, high altitude challenges and what equipment to bring extra equipment and all of that. It's interesting that I've, that the girl's mom has been on and told that whole story, but I can't seem to get her to come on. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah I heard I've, the mom episode. Yeah, I've given up on trying. I just, I don't, I think it's just something she doesn't want to talk about. I'm not certain. Back then, she was writing articles about it. She was everywhere, and I couldn't get her to come on the podcast. So I was like, oh, I'll take the mom. And isn't she a journalist? She is, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. maybe it's she doesn't like her voice on. I don't know. Her I, I would love to hear that story from her, from her mouth. <laughs> I know. I'll get her one day. Crazy don't, story. There's a couple of people I can't get that I'm baffled by. I'm like, wait. You won't do this? I'm like, huh, mm -hmm. all right, okay. We'll figure it out one day. Um, how? So you haven't been married that long? Have not been married that long. Oh, you're living my dream life. <laughs> <laughs> Minus the Peru but, part. And we have crunched so much into the time that we've been together. It's ridiculous. I mean, since 2014, wow. we have built a house together, had two kids together, um, and now pregnant with our third. It, it turns out when you're older, have um, good um, jobs and a little money saved, life's not that difficult. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're like, hey, yeah. we need a house. We'll just make one here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You want to have a baby? It's got to be easier than that time my insulin pump stopped working on a beach in Peru. <laughs> sure, why not? Yeah. You, it, you have a much different perspective. It's That's a really nice story. You are mm -hmm. what I point my children towards. I'm like, listen, oh, 30 good. years old at minimum before you're really serious with anybody. And yep. I think they look at my wife and I and they're like, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> we, <laughs> we see you guys have been together for freaking ever and somehow aren't that old. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> uh, that's a, I think that's really cool. So you Yeah, but I I am going into this third pregnancy and I you know have a few gray hairs now and I'm like I'm just really tired. I can't believe that I'm going to have like an infant almost going into my 40s. So that's a little scary. Oh no, after doing a lot of things right, you screwed this last bit up. But I didn't want to say that because there's a person's life <laughs> yeah. in this subject. <laughs> Two was fine, Kate. What were you doing? Yeah. <laughs> no, uh I my wife said to me a number of years ago, she's like, What if we just had another baby right now? And I said, It'd probably kill me. Mm -hmm. Just the staying up at night. It is a lot of work. I was like, I don't know that I can. Like there's part of me that thinks I figured out diabetes so I could sleep. Yeah, <laughs> and that I can't imagine being a parent. I always you know, now that I have kids, of course I'm I'm real emotional whenever I hear kids' stories and and thinking about folks that have to go through their, you know, two-year-olds and even younger being diabetic. I'm like, I would never sleep. Never. There was a long um, time where I didn't. Where, um, mm. And in fact, it wasn't until our, our second kiddo, he never slept through the night until he was like 13 months old. And uh. 
I mean, I was a walking zombie and there were times where people were like, you need help. I'm going to come stay the night and I'll get up with him. And um, even then, because I was just still on my injections that I was wearing a Dexcom and the alarms would be going off all night. So even though they were helping me, I still couldn't even sleep because I was postpartum. My numbers were still like I'm losing weight, but I'm also breastfeeding. So my, you know, my I'm burning calories. So it was just like a weird, I always struggled a little bit postpartum yeah. um, with my blood sugars and figuring out, how, you know, how to keep it. I mean, it's like a daily adjustment and on top of the baby, not sleeping through the night for 13 months. Uh, that is when actually I found your podcast. I don't even know how I fo- found it, honestly, but that is when I decided to get on the Omnipod and then eventually go to the loop. There were some logistical challenges and getting onto the loop and also wanting to be on the, on a pump again. I just always referred to myself as like this diabetic robot and I didn't want to have to wear another device and, um, and wanting to wear a bikini and not have all these things on me. But of course my, like my bikini days are over and worrying about that. So (laughs) that became less of a concern. And it was really only about sleep at that point. I thought you were humble bragging there for a second. I thought you were like, (laughs) Yeah, I had two kids in my 30s. I'm pregnant again. And I do get into a bikini still. I thought yeah. that's where you were like <laughs> no. quietly going with that. Like everyone just, just you know, no. feel jealous. No. Okay. Uh- <laughs> Guys, I'm going to go over it one more time. The 2021 Dancing for Diabetes show is back on a live stage in front of you. Looking to get back out there in the world and see some entertainment? Start here, Saturday, November 13th at 7 p.m. in the Walt Disney Theater at the Dr. Phillips Center in Orlando, Florida. Tickets start at $15, just $15. Can you imagine a night out for $15? Touched by type1.org. Go support a great organization, see some wonderful dancing. You guys might remember from years ago, Touched by Type 1 used to be called dancing for diabetes but they realized one day they're like we do so much more than dancing we need a new name anyway that's not the point you know they're touched by type one now but dancing for diabetes etymology just wanted to let you know blah 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 go see the thing stop messing with me don't make me say this over and over again touched by type one.org etymology entomology what is it when the, the history of oh it doesn't matter now gvoke hypopen has no visible needle and is the first pre-mixed auto-injector of glucagon for very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes, ages 2 and above. Not only is GVOC Hypopen simple to administer, but it's simple to learn more about. All you have to do is go to gvocglucagon.com forward slash juice box. GVOC shouldn't be used in patients with insulinoma or pheochromocytoma. Visit gvocglucagon.com slash risk. I, I, I too cannot wear a bikini if that makes sense. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. I have questions. Um, where are my questions? They're about, so when you had someone come over to watch a kid for a night, what you really needed was for them to also pump for you and take care of your blood sugar. So you could, you had too many, you had three different things going on. Yeah. In yeah. fact, the kiddo was probably like the least of it. Cause at least I could feed them and, um, go back to sleep. But you know, the blood sugar thing, it wasn't just high or low. I mean, it was like a roller coaster all the time. I just, um, yeah, so- I had challenges and luckily my, my under, my endocrinologist at the time, in fact, I think I found him. I had like a real nasty endocrinologist. I, I live in Nashville, um, Tennessee. And when I first moved here, um, in 2014, I, I just found one that seemed like was a good one. Um, and she ended up not being one. And then, you know, I kept trying to find the right one. So it was kind of like this revolving door. I mean, I wish that for all diabetic, especially type one diabetics, that there was like the, the pediatrician interviews. Like when you find your pediatrician, you can go out and schedule these like 15, 20 minute interviews to see if it's the right pediatrician. And I really feel like you should be able to do that for endocrinologists too, because it was, it was really challenging to find the right one. And event there, you know, I, I believe in signs and 
things happen for a reason. And I was at a friend of mine's birthday party and um, back when you had those things and she, there was another girl there and I noticed that she had an Omnipod device on her arm. And so I started talking to her about uh, diabetes, endocrinology or and finding the right endocrinologist and she mentioned, oh, and she also used to be an Omnipod rep. So she knew all the endocrinologists in the area. And she mentioned the doctor that I see now. And he's just been great. Like he's the one that said, okay, you know, why don't you just wear, you know, the, all your ads about just do the Omnipod trial. So I wore it and I was like, okay, this isn't, you know, so bad. And then listening to the, the loop, um, conversations on the on your podcast I'm like that is what I need like I don't I need to figure out how to make this work so that I can sleep again and it was like light years um change for me just the sleeping through the night and not having the decks come going off all the time no kidding well it's so it's interesting too because you've had a long history with diabetes where you didn't have any of that technology where you could visually see it. And then you bring the Dexcom in, but you're still doing shots. So the Dexcom to you in the beginning probably just felt like, oh, good, a visual representation of how poorly I do with this. Is that how it well, felt or not? Well, I wasn't doing so poorly. I mean, actually, um, I got on the, well, I'm going to say that. And you're like, well, that sounds pretty poor. But <laughs> Let's find I, out. I was traveling so much for work. This was in my late, 20s. I was traveling a lot for work, like all up and down. This was just nationally, um, all up and down the East Coast. And assassin for hire. <laughs> yeah. The, actually, people used, you know, would say make jokes about that just because I was flying, you know, diamond level or whatever, um, Delta. Now and now, of course, because there's been no trouble for a year, I'm just a peasant and um coach, but um <laughs> The stories of, for my travels were always, one time I had them pick me up at, in a limo at, I think it was a limo. It was a car. I mean, still, it was nice. They like literally before everyone started deplaning, a guy in a suit appeared and he said, are you, you know, are you Kate? And he took me down to this private car. So I went down like where they bring up the luggage and they took me to my next gate. Wow. It only happened once, but I mean, at one point I was. Um, you were, high, you, you were going good there for a while. Yeah. Huh? yeah. <laughs> now, now I don't want to travel because I'm just, you know, in like the middle seat in the back. <laughs> yeah. um, oh, it's easier when someone else is paying for it. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so anyways, I, you know, I, I was having, I was going through this really rough time. I mean, I, you know, looking back. I, I wish that my endocrinologist at the time was like, well, let's look at your, well, because I was on, oh, that I was on an injection. So, but it's still, they could have changed my basils and they could have adjusted maybe when I took the, and, you know, split them up or something, but I was having seizures. My blood sugar was getting too low at like three in the morning and I was dead asleep. So I'd wake up in this fog, like even walk to the refrigerator to get something to eat. And end up having a seizure in the kitchen. Jeez. Uh, one time I hit my head in the bathroom. And so I didn't want that to happen while I was traveling. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a time I remember going from my hotel room, not having a snack with me. That was bad, you know, bad preparation, which of course would not happen now. Um, but I had to walk to the vending machine on like a different floor. I'm in my pajamas in a hotel at like two in the morning. I mean, so I ended up getting on the Dexcom because of that. And so that stopped me from having, you know, at that time, gosh, I was having like, I had like 10 seizures and so they actually thought that maybe I was epileptic. So they did a sleep study and it was just bad, um, basal control Yeah, that's really crazy? what it was. And Were you using way too much basal insulin? What's that? Were you using way too much basal insulin? Like, what did the Dexcom end up showing you? Um, I I think that's what it was. I I honestly don't remember. Mm. (laughs) Um, But with the Dexcom, I mean, that was also light years. I remember that was like I was probably in my A1Cs then at that time was like 6.2 to 6.3. And you were low a lot though, right? And I was low a lot in the middle of the night. Yeah. That's how you kind of, you kind of cheated that the A1C a little bit, the test. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then yeah. I got on the Dexcom and then I went from like a 6.2 to like a 5.8. And you don't pass out anymore? I don't I don't think I've had a seizure since. Should we knock on something? Just like, Yes, yeah, I'll okay. knock on yeah. wood somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be the one who's like, you know, like the sports announcer is like, that guy hasn't given up a touchdown and oh, touchdown. Like, you know, I don't want to be the one to jinx you. Yeah. <laughs> but but that's amazing just to have that. Well, I bet you feel differently about being a robot now, huh? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I when the technology isn't working, like I've been having some Dexcom challenges this week and I've been on the phone with their support people um, for a few days this week. Um. I mean, I, I'm so like, this is so critical to my well being, And I mean, I was like a sob story on with their support, but I'm like, you know, I woke up with a blood sugar of 303 this a couple, a few nights back because the Dexcom sensor, you know, the message that you get when the sensor is nearing expiration, Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, connecting, what is it? Sensor warning three connecting in three hours or whatever it is. Right. It's a and, countdown to when it's over. Yeah. And it didn't connect all night. So my blood sugar and I I had had a low before going to sleep. And then I ate some ice cream, which was also a poor choice, knowing that I don't always get that exactly right. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, I had a dinner with a little bit of fat in it. And so that's what caused my blood sugar to go low because of the timing of it, which is what's what I'm struggling with a little bit in this pregnancy right now um, is the timing of the insulin. Um, And so I, on top of the dinner and then the ice cream, of course my blood sugar shot up, but anyways, I was on the phone with them and I'm like, I can't be pregnant and have my blood sugar at 303. Like this isn't going to work. They were convinced that it wasn't a transmitter problem. And I was telling them it was a transmitter problem. Um, so I ended up changing the transmitter and then everything was fine. I called them the next day. I'm like, look, this needs to be fixed. Yeah. If, you're, if your transmitters aren't going to run for three months, don't have them at a three month term so that my insurance only pays that. Have it be at two and a half months. Did they replace it? They did. They're yeah. sending me a transmitter and a sensor. Cool. Yeah. I found, um, what did we have something recently? One of them got stuck and they sent us two. They're like, here, here's an extra one for the trouble. And I was like, Oh, Thank yes. you. And I was like, thank you very much. I've also had that where I took a sensor off one time and I called in and I said, look, I, I'm, uh, I know how to use these things and this one doesn't work, you know? Mm-hmm. So we switched it and I said, I'd like you to replace it. And he goes, well, if you would have called in, I would have told you it was working. And I was like, well, that would have run counterintuitive to the fact that I didn't have any numbers here. And I would have told you no. And mm-hmm. he just like, like he pushed back and he was doing his job. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? And I stopped him and I said, listen to me. I am not on the phone trying to scam you out of a sensor. Is that what this is about? Like, is that what this line of questioning is about? I'm like, I know Mm -hmm. how to do this. I never call about replacements. Overall, my daughter's Dexcom lasts 10 days constantly, which must infuriate people Mm. who don't have the same uh, experience. Mm -hmm. But we make it to 10 days all the time. We're really good at, you know, sometimes it is user, like, not error, but... a little bit of an like it gets agency. bumped or something. You, you just don't know like what you're yeah. doing. Sometimes you don't know how to like work things out. Like for instance, while you and I are recording, Arden is down to her last unit and a half in her pump, and mm-hmm. like so we're getting every minute, every ounce out of that pump. And mm-hmm. you'll hear people say, "Oh, my pumps don't last very long." Like you know, like th- you kind of get it after a while. So I just made the point to the guy. I'm like, "Look, I'm like, just send me another one." And then he was like, "Okay." And you just realize, like, it's his job to make sure you're not shaking them down. You, oh, yeah, like the know? acetaminophen questions and yeah. the, where do you have it? And, like, I have it in the same place. I always have it. Some of that's for the FDA. Yeah. Some of those questions the FDA makes them ask. Some of them's for their own collection of data. But some mm-hmm. of it's just to make sure. Because when you're, when you're an honest person, you don't recognize how many people aren't. Or how many people mm-hmm. might be in a situation where they can't afford it, so they're just trying to get an extra one somewhere. Right. That that goes on constantly. Anyway. Right. I'm glad they sent you one. Yep. I, I mean, I think that they're really great, and I want them to do as well as possible, obviously, because of, you know, it is so critical to my well-being. And when I am with, and like, in that, the two-hour window of when it's warming up, I mean, I feel like I'm naked. Yeah, and that's something. How long have you had it? The Dexcom? Yeah, or- yeah CGM. So, um, 
that was when I would have been, yeah, late 20s. So it would be, yeah, probably about 10 years now. 10 years you've had it. Wow. So you you had like the first, do you have Dexcom 4 or 7 plus? Which, where did, where did you start? I, I, where did I start? I don't remember where I started. I'm on the 6 now. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. I already yeah. had it a good long time. Uh, listen, I have to agree. It's the single most important thing that we have. Yeah. Yeah. And I want nothing but success for that company. I I, I know, I, I know. And too. when I forget I, how I forget his name right now, that's just horrible. But the um, I think it was the CEO that you had on. Kevin. And yeah. he was talking yes, Kevin, and how um having folks in the hospital where I think it was, you know, around COVID and all mm-hmm. that and how um how great would that be for those folks that are in there to be on a Dexcom rather than getting finger pricks um, would be incredible. And and connecting that into, which is my line of business into the electronic medical record in the hospital so that the, you know, nursing and staff are just getting alerts in the same EMR that they're, yeah that they are getting alarms for everything else. And so that they see those trends um, would be incredible. Like you have, you know, I'm sure people on steroids, it does such, you know, has such an impact on your blood sugars and, and, and just do doing a spot check it. every once in a while. We yeah. know that that's not effective. I always think too, that that, that exact scenario is such a great backdoor way of training medical people about how insulin works and what it looks like for real to have type one diabetes or diabetes of any kind to be able to really see blood sugars. Do you know how valuable that would be to a nurse? Like how much they'd learn from watching your blood sugars, then what they could apply to the next person that they met. Exactly. Yeah. It would be such a big deal. I, I, oh my gosh. I remember, I cannot remember which kiddo it was, but well, you've passed out 10 times in your life. So, <laughs> so <laughs> there was a, what, after having one of the kiddos, they had me, Oh, I know it was the first one because that one I actually, you know, went through a long labor and all of that. But um, they hooked me up with, what you know, whatever glucose to give me um, to keep my blood sugar from going low because I wasn't eating all that. And after having the kiddo and then after, you know, eating and getting back on, they never turned it off. So then, of course, I spiked. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, come on. Come on, people. Yeah. No, they don't. They it's hard to get them to understand. I just interviewed somebody yesterday who is a, a a fairly newly minted CDE who says they work at a really great institution, and still the level of what people don't understand is shocking. Mm-hmm. So, hey, um, is there any chance you heard the pro tip that I just put up with Jenny about postpartum? No, uh, not yet. I was thinking uh, as I'm as we're talking, I'm like. I never do this, but I should have sent Kate an email last week and said, "Hey, can you listen to this ahead of time?" But um, yes, yeah. oh, I will. I mean, I'll. That'll be my priority today at some point to listen to that because well, that is just where I struggle. Well, you have so you've had this is your third, right? Mm-hmm. And first pregnancy MDI. Uh huh. Except, yep. And Dexcom. Yep. And and it was and here's the reason I you know I stayed on that throughout even the next pregnancy was because I think my A1C was like 5.2 at the end of the pregnancy. And so my, was good. my maternal fetal medicine, my high risk OB, I mean, she was like, if this is, this is working, let's not change it. I'm mm-hmm. not going to for, you know, ask you to go on the pump or change anything. If you're doing so well, in fact, my husband was like, Look, we need to just keep you pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> so good for your diabetes. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Do you um, think he was kidding? Uh, yes and no. Oh I think he goodness. likes the the getting there pregnant, <laughs> the trying to get pregnant. <laughs> Did part. you tell him we can do that without me having to carry a baby for nine months? Or, yeah. Or honestly, is he not allowed to do that unless you're making a baby? Maybe. No, no, no. But um, yeah, who knows who will listen to this? If parents or you know whatever will listen to this, but um, he's kidding. <laughs> uh, oh, we'll I say see. that you're saying personal people in your life you don't want to think you're not putting out. Is that what this is about? <laughs> It's a very 90s way of thinking about it. You know, the kids don't think about things. It's much more fluid now. It's fine. It's not your job to give anything away. It's his job to earn it from you. What do you think of that? Uh (laughs) Exactly. You're like, yeah, I've been married for a while, and that's not how it works. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, if your parents are listening, hi, what's up? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so... Yeah. You know, and talking about parents, it's funny because, you know, my first pregnancy, I told my mom, you know, my mom is a, a labor and delivery nurse. And mm-hmm. so she sees pregnancies that don't go well or deliveries really that don't go well. Um, 
people that take care of themselves and people that don't and how things can go south. And I think my mom is still, or was anyway, still in like steel magnolias days and that Mm. you're, you're going to have a baby and you're going to die. Um, so the first pregnancy, you know, was, went so well. I mean, it really became like a second, a second job, full-time job though, in managing my blood sugars to keep, to be at that 5.2. Okay. Um, a lot, I mean, at the end of the pregnancy, it's just so many physician appointments and, um, staying on top of the blood sugars and all of that. And then of course the postpartum, um, challenges, which I'll listen to that episode with Jenny and she's great. Um, and I've learned a lot of things or at least it like validates some of the challenges I have. So I don't feel so alone in you know, some of these things. Yeah. I, I can't tell you how often I hear that. Um, that I not, was another thing about the podcast I didn't expect. Like I expected to tell people things that they didn't know and that happens, but I never expected that just saying something that somebody would go, yeah, that's been my finding too. how valuable that feeling is. I didn't, mm-hmm. I didn't recognize that at all. And Jenny is terrific, but mm-hmm. yeah. So, so the first pregnancy goes well, you're on MDI, you've got a nice low A1C. So it goes well on paper, but did it go well otherwise? Fetal birth weight was where you wanted it, stuff like that? Yeah, everything was really great. I mean, um, I did have a like a 13 hour labor in which, you know, I even got to the point I was having contractions, I think like every two or three minutes, but baby's heart rate kept falling down. And so when that happened, like the third time where it dropped substantially, the whole team came in and said, okay, we're moving into a, an emergency C-section. And so that was it. And then, um, but baby was healthy. I you know, was healthy. Um, I just, I just had a, some challenges with like the roller coaster after baby and that, and that baby was also sleeping through the night at 11 weeks. So that was perfect too. And that is extremely helpful in getting better and like being more stable when you're up every like two to three hours, it's hard to to know which way is up or down. Mm-hmm. Did, you um, find, did you find your intra- insulin needs change almost immediately after you deliver the placenta? Yes. And so they, I th- want to say they drop it by half almost. I mean, almost really to back to where you were pre pregnancy. Yep, That's exactly what Jenny said when we, when we did that episode, I was but there is that. still so much fine tuning because of course you're like burning those calories, not sleeping, but you still have, you know, one of the other surprises for me was like, I thought when you delivered baby that your weight was going to go back to normal and that doesn't happen right away, (laughs) Uh, which seems so naive now, but yeah, it was still like I had a baby in there. So there was still a lot of weight to be lost and I was very committed and motivated to lose that weight. So I was, I mean, by the end of my um, maternity leave, I mean, I was back down to my normal weight and then eventually even because of the breastfeeding was down below it. So there were, I mean, when I lose a couple pounds, like I need to be adjusting my insulin rate. Mm -hmm. And that was so hard to see um, postpartum exactly what those weight losses were on a daily basis. And so I struggled there. Well, let me stop you. Make sure I understood what you said. You, you mean normally when you're not pregnant, if you're losing weight, that means your blood sugars are a little high? When I'm losing weight, well, I guess depending on which way you look, if I'm gaining weight, yes. If I gain a few pounds, it does have a big impact on my my blood sugars. Mm-hmm. And but, same with the losing, although these days I'm not really losing as much. Well, you're pre- how <laughs> so, pregnant are you right now? Uh, well, just in general, I'm not losing much. But Let's just blame um, the third pregnancy, Kate. How pregnant are you right now? <laughs> oh, nine weeks. Oh, yeah. You can't lose weight now. You're making a baby. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you're good. No, I'm, not, I'm not trying to lose weight now, yeah. but... I, I I was wondering if you were saying that high blood sugars were putting you in like a, a ketone situation and that's why. You oh, no, I'm not that sick. high. OK. okay I, I mean, sure. high for me is, you know, I don't I don't want to be going above 160. Yeah. Um. So first pregnancy, it went so well. We decided to get pregnant at when our first kiddo was eight months. So we with the yeah, I know we were pregnant with our second when we you know had an eight month old so they're Can 17 do, months apart let me do a little detective work here so and we're not going to say your last name but your last name <laughs> makes me feel like your husband is catholic am i right um i do not have my husband's last name oh, okay 
But yes, I was raised Catholic, but my husband was raised, I believe, Protestant. Okay. So it wasn't just that, like, we need to make... Or Episcopalian, I mean. Okay. So you're not just trying to make babies because that's how things are done. Or No. You- oh, my gosh. But the very Catholic part of my family, I have a one, she's a second cousin, and they have 11 children. Oh, my gosh. My mom is the oldest of seven. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, a lot of kiddos in our family. A lot of family. baby making. A lot of tired uteruses, I would imagine. Yeah. Just stretched <laughs> I out. mean, how do they do that? I have yeah. no idea, like but they do. Like a flat basketball, I would imagine by now. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. Just, like, just silly putty. Um, yeah. So, okay. So you, you're joking, but it went so well, you made another one. But are you not joking? Is it a bit of your age? You're like, okay, this worked and we're older. So another baby? Yes. There was that component to it. And also just liking the idea of having kiddos closer in age too. Yeah. It's lovely. Um, having kids So that was great. that. If, if I could go back to that spot in my life and not have all the like tired and indecision, like if I, if I could now somehow be younger with what's in my head now, I would love to raise a baby again. Like I know, mm-hmm. like I really feel like I know what to do now and I would really know how to absorb like the great parts of it. Oh. Uh, you know, and not be so like worried all the time about stuff and, hmm. you know, worrying about the sleep deprivation. I mean, it is a big deal, a yeah. big challenge. Yeah. I even like, I look at them and immediately I'm like, oh my God, I got to pay for college. <laughs> like, <you know. laughs> Gosh, we haven't even started. They, they don't even have hair. That. And you're like, how are you going to pay for college? Like I start <laughs> thinking about that right away. Uh, but no, I, I, I really did love it. But okay. So the second baby comes similar experience or no? Um, second baby was a little bit different. Um, I, like the pregnancy was similar. It was not, you know, my A1C at the end of it was not 5.2. It was closer to six. And that could be also because I had like another baby at home. So I didn't have as much time to devote to that second yep. full-time job of managing blood sugars. Um, so and, and it was a scheduled C-section for that one because of the risk of like a, a uterine rupture having been so soon after the first C-section. Was that just timing? Was that your age or was that diabetes? Was it a combination? What was that concern from? Just the time? Um, the, uh, because of like the first C-section scar, not or not scar, but the first C-section not has, I mean, they say to wait like 18 to two, 18 months to two years to okay. get pregnant again after a cesarean section. And we waited eight months. Why was the first one C-section? Because his heart rate kept dropping. That and reason. so okay. they, they were like, cause my contractions were, you know, every two to three minutes, they actually had to slow him down at one point because of the heart rate challenge. But there was no point I was ever going to get my water had already broke and my, there was no point I was going to be able to get to the point of even pushing because of the heart rate. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Um, I know you said that. I just, it, it slipped out of my head for a second. I wanted to make sure. Yeah, that's okay. okay. I mean, for me, it's like, it's, it's so, um, it's like a matter of fact. So maybe I didn't say, you know, all the details, but yeah, that's why that, um, that's why that happened. Okay. So, you know, I'll never have that normal delivery, but, at the at the end of the day, it's just important that, you know, baby's healthy and I'm healthy and all of that. Mm-hmm. So um, second pregnancy, not as controlled. Baby was a little bit bigger. So our first was like seven pounds, whatever ounce is normal. And then second kiddo. And I think that that did have a large part because of my control was eight pounds. I want to say something like nine ounces or Something like that. Yeah, there's a component to your blood sugar and the birth weight of the baby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And interesting when they were tracking it, because, you know, they do all the sizing, a lot of sizing every, like almost every other week or every week. And at the end of the uh, third trimester, and they had, they were tracking me at like seven pounds. Um, So they didn't foresee that. But of course, that's, they're doing the measurements via the ultrasound. So they don't really know for sure. But Mm. yeah, he was a little bit bigger. Okay. Um, the interesting thing that happened with that postpartum, of course, I had the same, I had similar challenges as before, but I was a little bit more aware of them. So I I think I was handling them a little bit better, but what happened next was just, um, totally off the wall and not expected. So, you know, similar to any 
mom postpartum, I was extremely exhausted and tired. And after getting baby down for the night, I wanted to go to sleep. So it's like 7 p.m. because that would be my longest stretch of sleep. So maybe for like five hours or something like that. And um, I, you know, started getting ready for bed and I just started to feel like really lethargic and tired, like so tired that I was holding onto the wall to get to the bed. Like I couldn't really hold myself up anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I got into bed and my hands were tingling a little bit. And sometimes that happens if like, if I, my hands are cold, I'll lay on them a little bit to warm them up. And so I was like, maybe I was laying on them funny. And then my feet were tingling and I'm like, okay, this is really weird. I just don't feel right. I look at my blood sugar. I'm like, okay, it's not low yet, but it was kind of on its way there. Like maybe in the seventies, like maybe I should just have a couple cookies and then I'll, I'll start to feel better. Okay. So I had those, I was in bed for like 45 minutes and I just couldn't fall asleep. So I, my husband came up and he was actually packing and getting ready to go on a trip. And we both traveled a lot for work at the, at that time. Um, and my sister luckily was there who had just moved back from the Peace Corps in Liberia. And so she was staying with us, I think for three weeks and, um, he came up and was talking to me and he was like, Oh my God, I'm going to go get you some more orange juice and cookies. And he, so he brings up orange juice and cookies. So at this point, this will send my blood sugar, you know, skyrocketing. Um, but I'm doing it because something isn't right. Yeah. And then, you know, I'm talking to him, but he can't understand me. So he goes to get my sister and she comes up and she's like, this isn't right. So they immediately call my stepdad And he's like, if this isn't her blood sugar, this is neurological and she, you need to call 911 and get her into the hospital. So at this point, like I am coherent. So of course, if your blood sugar is so low that you're, you know, you're incoherent, you don't remember any of that. Mm I am remembering everything very clearly. Um, I hear myself talking and it, it's like coming out slowly and the thought process is slow. I can't hold my arms up. I can't get out of bed. I know something is really wrong. And the first thing I think of is like, am I having a stroke? Like, this is what I've heard of all the signs. And is this what this is? Yeah. So they call 911, the ambulance comes, they do these. Did they do the test? I don't know if they did the test in the, um, in my, in my bedroom at that point. Um, but they were convinced that I was not having a stroke, that it was just a low blood sugar. Cause at this point, my number was low, even though I'd had, and that was the weirdest thing. It took my blood sugar forever to come up. It wasn't even until after I was in the emergency room after some time that my blood sugar finally came up. And so they were convinced even then that it was a low blood sugar, but right. the two, you know, coincided for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I remember, um, gosh, even like when my husband was, they were, you know, the, the EMTs were like, but do you want to, cause I'm in my nursing pajamas. They're like, "Would well, do you want to get something to wear to the hospital? And my, uh, you know, my husband goes to get me clothes and he actually gets my clothes or his clothes for me. And Boys. I'm like, Boys so are I, almost useless most of the time. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, Adam, so in my, so I'm saying this out loud. I'm like, Adam, we're at home. Like, get me my clothes. But no one can understand what I'm saying. No kidding. Um, it was so frustrating. And I remember like trying to signal like what I wanted to say and I couldn't. So he ended up just giving me my bathrobe. So I'm wearing my PJs and bathrobe to the hospital. But he has a blazer and a change of pants. So that's actually. Cool. <laughs> yes. Yep. So um, luckily my sister was there. She stayed with our, our first kiddo and the or well, yeah, because we ended up bringing baby because I, I was just two weeks postpartum so that I could breastfeed. So baby goes with us to the hospital um, and, it, you know, in the emergency room, they give me like, I, I don't, I can't remember what it's called, but it's like dextrose, like 8,000 or mm-hmm. something. Like you actually like feel it go through your body. Your it's mainlining cold. Sugar. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, why don't people want this? Like before, like a, a softball game or like a tennis match, this is incredible. Um, but yeah, then I was, my blood sugar was high for like the next 48 hours because of all that 
stuff that they, you know, yeah. that I had had already and that they had given me. Um, and then that's when they brought in the neurologist and started doing all the tests for having a, a potential stroke. And, you know, I, they found out that I had a TIA. So a trans ischemic attack, it's like a mini stroke. Mm -hmm. And, um, what they do for that is they give you, if you are within the, like the three to four hour window of having it, then you can take what's called a TPA and, um, it's a risky drug in that if you do have any sort of bleeding anywhere that it, you know, could kill you. Um, so we had to have like a quick group family grouping in the hospital. Like, should we do this or not? Um, and you know, they had done a cat scan and didn't see anything. So we opted to do it. Um, and then had to stay in the ICU for a few days for observation and, 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 you know, everything ended up being okay. So of course they tried to find out, you know, why did this happen? Um, they did an, uh, invasive echo, I think, um, in which they gave me the, whatever the drug that Michael Jackson was taking. Propanol. Yes, yes. In order to go under for that. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is the best nap I have had in a long time. Propanolol. Excuse me. No, wait, that's yeah. a beta blocker. That's not right. I, what was the first one you said? Profile. Hold on. Let me just type in Michael Jackson juice and see what comes up. Yeah. Um, yeah. Prof, propofol. P -R -P -O yes, that sounds right. Okay. So um, they checked for that and that all looked good. They did a bajillion MRIs and didn't see anything. Um. So every, you know, I was leaving there knowing that there wasn't, there wasn't any damage from it, which was great. Um, but also not knowing why it happened. Mm. Um, and so the last thing that they were going to test was they were going to do a blood clotting disorder panel, but they couldn't do it so soon after um, having the baby because it could come back with like a false positive. And so I had to wait, I think another four weeks or it was like at four weeks I, I went and did that and they come to find out I do have a blood clotting disorder called prothrombin factor two and so of course pregnancies and surgeries both of which I had had um are super high risk um also along with long trips and planes and in cars which I had done often I mean I was on like a monthly 10-hour flight to Chile um, for like the last two years mm -hmm. at that point. Um, so luckily that didn't happen on the plane yeah. where, you know, people would have thought that that was just kind of like how I talked or, you know, that was normal for me. What, what's that, the clotting disorder called? Prothrombin factor two. Is that better news than I might have a stroke later in my life? Well, what that means now is that, and I, and I think you can have that. I mean, you could actually have that your entire life and not know it. Mm -hmm. um, what it means now is that I have to take a baby aspirin every day. Okay. Um, and now, and also what it means during pregnancy, which I, you know, I had a, you know, I had to talk with my high risk OB prior to trying to get pregnant to make sure that it would be okay that I got pregnant. So not only my type one, but now I have this other condition and I'm 38. And she was like, Oh, yeah, we'll get you on blood thinner shots. And you'd main you'd maintain those blood thinner shots throughout the pregnancy. And as well, I think through six weeks postpartum. Um, and I have plenty of patients that are prothrombin factor two. So if she was not worried, and she's like the best of the best. Um, so uh, yeah, so I've started taking Lovenox shots once or twice a day, one in the morning, one at night. Um, and I mean, I don't, I'm not worried. Mm -hmm. Of course, my mom, who is still in Steel Magnolias yeah. days. Is she like, had you dead 10 years ago, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, she was begging me to never get pregnant again and actually was like, well, what? Are you, why would you even do that? And of course, I don't want to die. So, you know, I've been very diligent and researching and going through and doing all of the right things and really trying to manage the blood sugar. Hence my call to Dex or my calls to Dexcom about the the needing for the things to work because, you know, I don't need any more challenges here. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> so yeah, so that is that's that. That's amazing. That's it. Really is like a whirlwind. Like you, you, your life feels like it. It goes a hundred miles an hour since you were like eighteen years old. <laughs> Do you have? Hey, you only have one life, so I'm you gotta say, live it well. You're getting your you're getting your mileage out of this thing. That's for certain. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so right now you're in this third pregnancy. All this has been true. Nine weeks is the first trimester. Is this the part where it's not too tough yet, blood sugar wise? Well, it should be. It's interesting. I, you know, I, it's crazy because, you know, our kids are only three and two still. So it's not like it was that long ago, but I think you probably know after having kids that your memory just goes. Arden, um, wait, wait. Last night I was working out in the basement and Arden was walking on the treadmill and she said, have you noticed mom's getting a little old? And she points to her <laughs> head and I'm like, what? She goes, you probably don't notice because you're married to her and you love her, but she's slowing down a little bit. And I'm like, wait, what's going on? She goes, you are too, but not as bad. I was like, what is happening here? She goes, you're not as sharp as you used to be. And I was like, but I know more now. And she goes, it's unfair, isn't it? And I said, well, yeah, it is. But uh, but she notices it. And I do too. There are sometimes I reach for words and they're not there. Mm -hmm. And they are words I know and I commonly use. And I'm a person who talks like a million miles an hour. So you might not notice it. But in any hour of this podcast, I have to choose a different word three times because I can't find the one I want. Right. And well, you can tell her it's all because of her. <laughs> oh, who, yeah. Oh, oh, don't worry. I immediately blamed her. Are you kidding? Yeah. <laughs> immediately. I was like, do you have any idea how rested I would be without the two of you? <laughs> I, like, I think, I mean, it'd be interesting to know the poll on folks that haven't had kids. Like, do they get gray hairs later in life than those that do have kids? Because I, I honestly think that that's the main cause. <laughs> uh, the first time you get a white hair inside your nose is a come to Jesus moment. You're just, <laughs> yeah. You're like, I'm not there yet. You know? And my vision is now I had perfect vision my whole life and a couple of years ago i suddenly needed reading glasses and last night my son says uh i need to throw a little bit like can we go outside and i'm like yeah sure so keep in mind i'm gonna be 50 in a couple of months mm -hmm. and he plays baseball in college and so i'm oh, out yikes. there get I'm those like, glasses on oh my god i look up at him he's blurry Right. He's 50 feet away from me. I can't focus on him. The ball's coming at me like a meteorite streak. I can't mm -hmm. see the roundness of it anymore. And I'm catching it in front of my face over and over again. And I walked inside afterwards and I said to Kelly, I'm like, I got to get glasses just to have a catch with him. Yeah. I, I was like, because he's going to kill me with that ball. Like he's just tossing it to me. That kick and throw a ball over 90 miles an hour. Like I'm going to, wow. I'm going to eat it at some point and I can barely keep up now. It's, yeah. We'll either get glasses or get like the full catcher's gear <laughs> to, full catcher's to gear. play catch. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to make another person catch with him. Like I'm going to have to hire a person because there is going to be a moment. I already he can't throw to me at full speed. Like that's just we, we stopped doing that a number of years ago. I just was like, mm -hmm. you can't do that anymore. I can't react that quickly. But it's the um, it's the telling your son that that's disappointing. Yeah, that I'm almost 50 and sorry, you have I'm, to be a little bit more delicate yeah, be with gentle, me. <laughs> be gentle with me. Yeah. You know, and he doesn't see anything special about it. People listening who understand know that he throws a lot harder than most living people. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that he doesn't think of it that way. He, yeah. He just thinks of it as I am at this level and this old guy can't keep up with me. And apparently the witty banter that my wife and I are feeding to Arden is not quick enough anymore. So <laughs> yeah. it's like, what the hell? But no, you guys I, have to pick it up a notch. Well, and how am I going to do that? I'm exhausted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I, I really want to keep in touch with you because I feel like when that kid's 20, you're going to have like abandoned them in a store by then. <laughs> <laughs> a what you're gonna have just like left them somewhere by mistake you know what i mean like oh uh mommy didn't leave you at the straw bridges and clothier on purpose but i needed a break <laughs> uh because i'm because yeah. you're gonna be 55 when this kid's what like yeah how what will i be i'll be 39 oh well, like in their they'll be in their teens how old will you be when the last right? one graduates from high school i don't know scott don't make me do that math <laughs> you, I, I just want you to cry once while we're doing the podcast <laughs> Please no. Yeah, too old, too old. You know, I think about, you know, because I'm fairly certain this is going to be a boy and we have two boys already and that in itself, you know, is caused the gray hairs. It's I love 
the boys. Um, but they are a lot of work, especially when they're younger. Yeah. Um, girls don't become trouble until they're teenagers, yeah, right? Yeah. It's not trouble. It's just, it's that, that's, that's where their hard part comes in. Mm-hmm. And boys are just like, uh, they're like rockets that are untethered and they just mm-hmm. keep going off all day long. And ugh. Yeah. So right now I'm like a jungle gym. I mean, they're like punching me, climbing on me, hitting me, screaming, running around. Like there's no calm moments. I feel like that our friends that have little girls are like playing with their dolls and it's all quiet and peaceful. Like we don't have that. My son used to run around the house in full costume sometimes. He would be mortified if he knew I said that, but he had a (laughs) Spider-Man costume that he would just wear when he was like three years old Mm -hmm. and just ran Um, around the house. Our little, our oldest has like superhero everything. So he'll have different superheroes on in his underwear and his socks on his shirt. Um, He has a cape that he wears around a lot. He's really into superheroes too. Nice. Well, Well, but I know the part, like my wife has said to me, She's like, you know, I've probably been hit in the face by the kids a half a dozen times in my life, like hard. Mm -hmm. And they don't do it on purpose. Like they're swinging their hands around or something. And you're just like, you walk into it or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, it's really something. But is it great? Like if I can get away from the, 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 the tone of the conversation and ask you a question, you waited till you were a little older. You had a, a full life when you were younger. You were more prepared, like probably emotionally and financially, I'm guessing, mm-hmm. and everything. Did you do it the right way for your money? Do you feel good about it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think as a diabetic, you always just have to think about like how I think maybe how well your body can recuperate after Mm -hmm. having kiddos so late. Yeah. I mean, that's my only, you know, and Adam and I I said a name when my husband and I got together, we, you know, we said, oh, we want five kids. So, you know, that. Catholic background and him only having one sister and they're 10 years apart. It was like, he was an only child and he loves going home and being with my family. And it's a huge family and it's a lot of fun. And so he wanted a big family. So did I, but because of the timing, it just wasn't going to happen. There's no way I could have two more kids and we could adopt. And we've, we've talked about that, but I just think because of age, it's just not, it's probably not going to happen. And of course we always wanted that little girl um, but I don't think that's going to happen either. I think I'm destined to just be a boy mom, but yeah, don't fall into that trap. Like don't fall into the, like, we'll just give it one more shot. You'll end up with four yeah. boys <laughs> yeah, or, or three boys and one girl who just looks like a deer in headlights for 10 years. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so uh, who well. knows? Yeah, we'll see. It could be, I'll know, I think next week for sure. What do you um, mean it's what? looking like a boy? Is it like a ultrasound? No, next week I get the lab work that'll tell me for sure. Okay, mm-hmm. but did you? But a minute ago you said like you think it's going to boy. Is it just because you think you're just going to have a boy, or is there some reason? Well, th- there is this test you can take, and right now I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's you can take it at home, which of course is like a finger prick for us diabetics. That's no big deal, um, and it just you know you have to have a clean area because you what it detects is male. DNA. And if it detects male DNA, then it's a male. If there's no male Y D chromosome found in it, then it's a female. Oh. You're supposed to do it at, you can do it as soon as eight weeks. That's when that Y chromosome can be detected. And um, we had a strange week in Nashville where we actually had snow and our kids were home and we were able to go sledding. That happens like every five years here. Yeah. And I had ordered the test in advance so that I was ready to go right at the eight week mark. And I just lost, I ordered it and had it there and I did it a week early. I just lost track of time and thought this is the Saturday I do it. And I realized that after I did it and packaged it up, I was like, Oh my gosh, I wasn't supposed to do this for another week. So I really did it at seven weeks. So I wrote them and I said, Hey, you know, I accidentally sent this in early. I don't know if that's going to be, um, like legit still or valid and yeah. should I get another one? And they were like, well, you know, you'll most likely get, so they responded to the same day, or at least I saw the response the same day I got the results. And they're like, most likely you are going to get a girl result because it doesn't detect the male chromosome or yeah, the, the male DNA yeah. until eight weeks or that's at least when it can be guaranteed. And Um, if you did get a male result, then it could be, um, 
what was it? It could have been compromised or the word I'm looking for. I'm drawing a blank on right now, but it, it could have been, uh, not clean, whatever. like your husband touched you or something well, like that. Or, yeah. Like, yeah. and that was why it was so specific, especially cause we have, you know, even our dog is a boy. Um, <laughs> so there, and they said that, you know, even pets can, you know, be part of that male DNA. And if they detect that, then it'll show that it is a male. Um, and you know, the only thing that I did that could have potentially uh, contaminated, that's the word I was there looking for is I, you know, I washed my hands numerous times, but I dried my hands on the towel that, that we all touched. dry our hands on. So the test came back that you're having a schnauzer. Is that right? <laughs> a golden doodle. Oh, okay. A golden doodle. <laughs> I wouldn't have said that out loud, but I hear you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my husband's convinced. I mean, it's my, he is my favorite guy in the whole household. He is my easiest, easiest person to deal with in this house. Although not really a person, but he is my my favorite. (laughs) I was going to (laughs) say. So yeah, so, you know, but even then I I dried my hands on that towel, but then I used an alcohol swab for where I was pulling the blood from on that finger. So you would think it would be okay. So what did it, did it come back and tell you what? Boy? And it came back and told me, boy. Yeah. So yeah, you're just trying to so. hold out hope. I hear what you're saying. <laughs> it's the dish towel hope. Yeah. I, I, um, I'm I going to start betting. I know which way I'm going to put my money down. So I'm good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe you guys just make boys. That And that's exactly what our doctor said that, you know, some people, you know, the males, they just have male chromosomes, I guess. is You know, that's what they contribute. And that's that's it. So yeah. I think that that's Adam. So just have seven more. One of them will be like, no, please don't do yeah. that. Like I just, I, could you afford to like keep making babies or like at what point would you just say to yourself, like financially, I can't do this. Like, I forget don't know. The I have not done that financial analysis, but I wonder that like you have to make a lot of money to do all of that. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 um, the range for college right now is community college three to five thousand dollars a year up to pro- what is this hold on a second this isn't supposed to happen give me one second mm-hmm. that phone is not supposed to ring through um it could be from like three to five thousand dollars for community college up to there are some private colleges that cost seventy five thousand mm-hmm. dollars a year and I'm not saying you need to go to one of those. I'm just saying that it, th- that's the range. Well, that's well, that's when you have to bank on your kids getting financial scholar or yeah, that yeah, doesn't happen and, or if academic you, scholarships or. But there's a certain amount of money that you make, and if you make that amount of money, then that's not going to happen either. And it's just, it's a maddening world to be in. And then to have your kid come home from college and go, "Oh, that semester was a waste of time," and you're like, "Wait, what?" No. Yeah, what about the X amount of money I just spent on that? Whoa, 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 no, 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 no. Go back and learn something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a, it's a, it's, and that was, I can remember when we had kids your kid's age, which is so weird because I'm not that much older than you, but um, the amount of money we thought was going to send them both through college ended up being the amount of money it took to get one of them through college. Mm. And now Arden has let different designs on college, which might end up being cheaper and helpful very much. So, mm. uh, but if they both went to the same type of institution, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had nearly enough set aside and still, you know, you're taking out loans and it's just mm-hmm. the whole thing's a disaster. Anyway, good luck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> We've started a college fund for both of them. Hopefully that'll get us through. Yeah. Right. No, it'll be, it'll be the money you throw at them and go, look, we had good intentions. Good luck with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you enjoy yeah. soccer when you were seven? Then shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right now we're in swim lessons and it's just, yeah, I'm not looking forward to all the, the carting around to all of the activities. Yeah. You, you, sometimes you fall into a thing. And you just kind of become the people that do the thing like baseball mm-hmm. and softball ended up being what happened around here. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know, it, it could end up being anything. Maybe you'll just have like, maybe the kid will just be like, I would like to sit in the house and play chess. You're like, oh, I hope not. No. What if they do? What if they're anti Kate? I don't know. What we'll if you're see. like, we're going to Peru and one of your kids is like, mm, no, we're not. 
yeah. Oh, I also, I also would, I mean, knowing that that's what I did, I also wouldn't want my kiddo to be like, I'm going to Peru. It's just scary. And the things that happened to me there too, I didn't even get into that, but um, yeah, that is scary too. And like the letting go of, you know, being the parent and them growing up has got to be really challenging, but we've got some time before we're there. Yeah, finding um, finding the balance between what you were okay with for yourself and what you're okay with for them is tough. Um, yeah. But you have to try to remember that the things you did probably turned you into the person you are. And if you stop them from doing stuff like that, then they'll just become some homogenized version of themselves. Right. You know, but how do you not worry about them? Like, do you know, mm-hmm. I think I've said this in the podcast once maybe. I've been a daily driver of an automobile since I was 13 years old because I grew up in a house with a mom and didn't drive and my dad left and we need. Yeah. I think I do remember listening to that. Mm -hmm. If that were true of my kids, I would be out of my mind. Mm -hmm. Right. Gosh, I can't even, I am not looking forward to the day that we, they are going to be driving a car. I've also been in some really serious car accidents. Mm -hmm. Um, it, because of other people on the road, never my own fault. And that is also terrifying. They drive away the first time and you think, oh, so I put 17 years into this and now it's going to die. That's exactly how it feels when they drive. Away yeah. The first time. Yeah, it's terrible. Oh, uh, I mean, I think that at the time my kids are driving, we might all have like self regulated, you know, hovering cars. And, you know, the statistics of how many people have, have died in car accidents is going to be a distant. Yeah, it'll be that where they're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe that many people died from car accidents. they will just be something new to worry about. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Do do you know how many days of my senior year of high school I did not go to school? No. Guess. How many? 30. 52. (laughs) (laughs) I just went to work instead. Like we were broke and I needed the money. So Mm -hmm. I would just get up in the morning and go to work. Wow. And the place I worked was like are you allowed to be here? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. It's good. Don't worry. Just, and yeah, that was it. And that was in the eighties when they were like, all right, I mean, if he's going to work, I ain't going to say anything. And and, right. that, and that was sort of the end of it. But if my children missed uh, a couple of days of school every year, I'd be like, Hey, we got to really rethink what's going on here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it'll be something, yeah, but it'll be something else. Like, you know, I agree with you. Like cars are probably going to be self-driving and there'll be algorithms that keep us from bumping into each other. And, mm-hmm. and then it'll just, I don't know. Who knows? But Who knows what it'll be then? I can tell you this. After living this year in my house, all of those possibilities are preferable to not. Yeah. I would rather I would rather live a life of risk uh, and uh, reward than a life of no risk and uh, staring at this wall. Mm-hmm. So, so. Oh, my gosh. I, I remember listening to a podcast, and I don't remember which one it was, that where you were talking about like how you had to go in and pick up your food, but you forgot your mask. Uh, Some, maybe it was like yeah. Arden had a low blood sugar or something, mm-hmm. and and you needed to get the food, and there was a lady in there that you know, or people that were looking in, at you like you were a Martian from outer space because you didn't have the mask, which, of course, is normal anywhere now, yeah. and I'm guilty of it, too. And especially now because I'm pregnant. Um, But yeah, it's just so weird. I cannot wait for it all to be over and where this is like a distant, horrible nightmare memory. Yeah. My my expectation here is that vaccines roll out farther and farther. The weather changes and that pretty much changes people's focus. Mm -hmm. And then I don't think personally – like I'm all for doing whatever is valuable for people. Like I really am. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. I can't imagine what would have to happen to talk people back into their homes for an extended period of time again. Yeah. Or to wearing masks yeah. forever. Yeah. I mean, no, it's funny. Like there's part of me that's like, I can't wait to not need to do that anymore. And there's part of me that's like, you know, I didn't get sick at all this year. I didn't even have a cold. Our kids either is incredible. Yeah. Like maybe I would put a mask on at the grocery store still if I didn't need to or something. Like I don't know what I'm going to end up doing like once Mm -hmm. this part is passed. Uh, Or maybe more antibacterial whenever you go out. Yeah. I don't know. Like I don't do the hand sanitizer as much as I did in the beginning. I I just cover my face in public. Mm -hmm. And um, I have not been, I I haven't even had like a cold in a year. I know. I know. 
And, and with a three and a two year old and them being at school, I mean, we were going through cycles of colds like all the time. Well, even like one time our oldest got hen foot mouth. This was when he was like, I think a year or nine months or something like that. And my husband got it really bad, like blisters all over his feet and wow. hands and throat. And, um, but yeah, whatever the, in like the stomach virus, when that goes through the house. So yeah, this year was pretty incredible not being sick, but then like, who cared? We were all at home in our sweatpants anyways. Yeah. I might rather have the flu. Um, <laughs> yeah. Hand, than sustain that for another year. Uh, hand foot mouth is what preceded Arden's type one diagnosis. And so do they think that that can, are they, you know, is nobody, there, nobody guesses, but I mean, it threw her autoimmune system into overdrive and it didn't get rid of the hand, foot and mouth. So, yeah. you know, it, she had an autoimmune response. And if I look back now, it, I mean, that's probably what happened. Hand, foot, mouth, autoimmune response. And then like a month later, she had the hand, foot, mouth again. And my doctor's like, you're not supposed to get this twice. That doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense. So it's possible that it never handled it the first time. And yeah, that, it's interesting. And, you yeah. know, for the record, I was never sick before. Like, there was never any sort of major diagnosis for me. How about stress or anything like that, even? There was some stress. Yeah. Could be. That. There were, there are actually some major stresses. Yes, I found it. You don't have to tell me what it is, but that's probably what happened. Yeah. yeah. Like familial. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So could that be it? Maybe. Yeah, we think Certainly that we think that uh, school stress might have flipped my son's thyroid around recently. Mm. So. Stress is such a bad. I mean, obviously, you know this, like the what that does to blood sugars. Yeah, imagine it's so what it's bad. doing. To we see else. that firsthand, but a lot of people don't know like what stress is actually doing to your body. Yep, but at least we see that. No, I, I I completely agree. Like it's one of those valuable spots where somebody with type one can say knowing what's happening inside of your body is actually valuable in a lot of different ways. And most people don't get any view into that at all. Mm -hmm. You know, that's it. That's for me. That is it for me as well as like Chinese food. (laughs) I just think I'm like, I can't eat it. There are. Yeah. No, I don't know what's in it. It's hard for me to manage it because of the unknown. And yeah, I'm sure, you know, if I wanted to spend some time and really like work on, that I could, mm-hmm. but it's not, not worth, worth it, it to me. So I don't, I, I wore a CGM one time and it definitely pointed out a couple of foods. I'm like, yeah, I don't want to, I, w- I just won't eat those anymore. Cause my body doesn't do well with it. Yeah, you know exactly. So, and you learn that from watching Arden eat all the time. Like what's impacts you so harshly that, you know, a, ma- not worth it. a mountain of insulin doesn't help it, you know? So mm-hmm. yeah, you got to make some choices. Well, well, and speaking about also with COVID, I, this might be interesting for the pregnant community. It's interesting, you know, the differing opinions on it. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's like my my OB told me to go ahead and because I had a I was scheduled for a vaccine at the end of February, and I had reached out to my OB like in the case I can get scheduled, should I go ahead and do it? And they of course sent me all this literature from like ACOG and um, all the other. OB um, resources that said, yes, go ahead and get it. Um, And then when I spoke to my maternal fetal medicine physician, who is like world renowned, um, smart lady, she said, um, I had an appointment scheduled for the next morning. I was like, Hey, I think you're going to say, okay, but I just want to double check. Like, should I go ahead and get the vaccine tomorrow? And she said, no, I would wait until your second trimester. Yeah, there's um, no I, I know someone else that just is like nine weeks, just like I am. And she got the Moderna vaccine. Like they were pregnant, but didn't know they were pregnant yet. And mm-hmm. it was like, a few, so a few weeks back and she ended up in the hospital for a couple of days. Really? Um, I don't, I don't know the specifics of it. So, I mean, it could be unrelated who yeah. knows, but I, I don't know that it is either way. I'm like, eh, I don't know that I want to be the first. Well, that's where find that, out. Yeah, that's where that data is going to come from. Is that just these anecdotal things that end up getting reported because the you know the vaccines are out in emergency youth author, authorization, so they haven't been as extensively tested as mm-hmm. you would have to to have an FDA clearance. And so you're going to wait and see, and then it's going to take time for them to collect data and have better answers. Yeah, I right. don't, and I think. Just because there's so much development in that first trimester is, you know, why I'm guessing she said that. And yeah, oh, I'm um, sure she doesn't know either. I'm sure she's just like, look, right. this is probably the safe thing to do here. 
safer than mm-hmm. the other. It's all mitigation of risk. Risks. That's mm-hmm. all it is. You know, you're just you're just making decisions about like, is this a better decision than that one? Then we'll do that one. Yeah, they're for mm-hmm. the same reason that I'll end up getting a vaccine because, you know, uh, I, I, I think I'm okay. I think I'd be one of those people who would just get it like a like a normal. But I don't know if oh. I'm going to be one of those persons who's going to need a five way bypass afterwards. So I'll, mm-hmm. I'll take a vaccine. You know, right? That's all. Yep. Just- so, so now I'm going to get one at the end of March. But um, I mean, she's had many patients end up in the ICU, so she's very much pro vaccine. But I think it was just the timing of it and not knowing. Like I've, I actually had a friend from high school that just had a baby and she is a physician. So she got it in, I think, December, the vaccine, or it was either that or early January. And so she got it in her third trimester and she just had the baby a few weeks back and baby's fine. Mom's fine. Yeah. Um, and so there are those anecdotal stories, but there's no one that would have had the vaccine in the first trimester and already have delivered a baby. So I'm like, eh, I don't know that I want to be one of those, like, let's wait and see. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you won't, you know, and those babies haven't grown up yet and nobody's tracked them. And there's, mm-hmm. there's, there's a lot of, listen, there's a lot of valuable reasons to do either, to be perfectly yeah. honest, you know? And so if you can stay in your house and keep your mouth covered and wait a little longer then. Why not? If that's something you're able to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Think. It's just three more weeks at this point. Three more so. weeks till you find out you're having a little boy and you can get vaccinated. <laughs> yep, exactly. And then I'm a free woman. I'm telling you right now, I, if you have, if you're, if you find out it's a girl, I want to know immediately, please don't even tell your husband. Oh, first. I will be screaming it from the mountaintops. You'll hear, you'll hear it. <laughs> <laughs> that's excellent. Kate, I, I, I'm having a very good time talking to you, which is how I can say we've been talking for almost an hour and a half and probably don't realize it. Um, but I want to thank you for doing this and ask you if there's anything we didn't talk about that, that we might've missed. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I think we covered it unless you can think of something that I should share that you think would be helpful to, you know, for everybody. I'm always happy to do that, but I'm, you know, always available. If someone wants to contact me, you have my email. Um, you are welcome to send them my way. Okay. Well, if somebody reaches Um, out, I will definitely send it to you then. Okay. Yeah, that's amazing. I I really appreciate this. There's part of me that wants to stop the recording and ask you about all the bad things that happened to you in Peru. But um, (laughs) anyway, I do have one question for you. If you'll hold on just one second. Give me one second. Sure. Thanks. All right, everybody. We're back for a second. Um, I'm going (laughs) to ask Kate one more question. Are you or have you put your kids through trial net? Yeah. So I can't remember at what point they can join it. I want to say it's like two years or two and a half years where you can go and get that initial blood work. Mm -hmm. And so our youngest is actually at the point where he could do it now, but because of COVID, I'm like, we'll just wait um, until we're all in a safer, you know, the, we're all vaccinated basically. I mean, not, not them, but the larger community. And I'll take him to do it. I did take the first. Um, you could go, I think the location here, and I think the only location here in Nashville was in, at Vanderbilt. And um, I will say that it was really, really hard um, to bring a two and a half year old um, there, you know, to get blood from their veins. <laughs> um, he was screaming at the top of his lungs and then was slightly frightened because I called it the doctor um, to ever go to the doctor again. But it is hands down worth it. Um, I totally believe in everything that they're doing. And in the you know, of course, I'm worried that our kiddos could be type one diabetic. And that, of course, could come at any point. Um, but if we could get in sooner than later, just to delay that or and also help, um, you know, provide data for research to find a cure for type one diabetes, we'll, you know, we'll do it. I'll deal with that hour of really tough time getting blood, you know, from a two and a half year old. Did he have um, any antibodies? He, he did not have the antibodies. That's lovely. Good. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm sure at any point that can be developed. And I actually learned that as part of my pro thumbin factor two work is because not only did they find that I was positive for that, but they also found antibodies that were present that made that a little bit more severe to some extent. So they, they did another follow-up in which they found out that the antibodies then went down. Um, anyway, so I know that that is relevant to some extent no, that is. Uh, because of that. That's interesting. Well, I'm, I'm glad that we chatted for a second and brought that up because I, um, I think it's a, a great thing. I'm actually interviewing uh, someone tomorrow who makes that 
drug that they give you now when they find out that you've just been diagnosed or that when you have the, you know, that drug that they say kind of stretches out the time that takes you to get diagnosed with type one. I'm yeah. Gonna, I just listened to that podcast that you, that you, I'm looking at my phone right now, like number four, four, three. That was the one I was listening to last with, with the person from trial net. I'm actually going to talk to somebody yeah. who it works at the company that developed the drug tomorrow to find out more about what the drug does. That's awesome. Yeah. I will be listening to that cool. too. All right. Thank you. All right. Now I'm going to let you go for real. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Kat. Yeah. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. Hey, one more time. Touched by type1.org. It's an organization doing incredible things for people living with type 1 diabetes, and they put on a really spectacular dance show that harkens back to the beginning of this organization. If you haven't heard that episode with Elizabeth Forrest, find it. It's in there somewhere in the catalog. She tells you how she started this whole thing. For now, touched by type1.org. And a huge thanks to Kate for coming on the show. And I promised you an update, an update on Kate, a Kate date, a cup, a cup date, a cup date. Oh no. A Kate date. A Kate. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'm rushing. Like I told you earlier and I apologize. My thoughts are not forming correctly. Kate sent a note that said this. It's a boy, three boys, four and under. Please send help. I have come to terms with the fact that it will be pure chaos around here for the next few years. Congratulations, Kate and family. That's really amazing. Kate said that since we talked, she thought of things she wished she would have brought up during the podcast. That happens to everybody. Don't worry about that. Um, she said that she's had a slight increase in her insulin needs at the very start of the first trimester, but then it plateaued and even dropped a bit again. And there's some other private stuff here. She told me it's not for you guys, but that's fair enough, right? Kate, thanks for reaching out. I mean, I'm assuming we recorded this so long ago. Your son's probably in college by now. Mazel tov. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. And by the way, if you're enjoying the Juice Box Podcast, please leave a beautiful, glowing, well-written, and thoughtful review wherever you listen. And don't forget to attach as many stars to it as your app allows. Like if your app has like a five star thing, like the Apple podcast app, give it five stars and put a real thoughtful review down that might make someone else interested in listening to the show. I love you guys. I'll talk to you soon.